Hey, everybody, give Jesus a hand clap. Come on. Clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Praise His name. Hallelujah. Glory. Uh, the way we praise Him in Texas is yippee-i-yo-ki-yay. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I have no idea what that means. It might be something really bad. I never asked what it meant, but anyway, it sounded cool. I saw some faces that I don't uh, haven't seen before. How many of you have never been in a service with me? Wow, great. Well, as he said, I'm I'm Larry Huggins, and uh, been coming to this church since the early '80s, and watching it grow, and watching the Purcell family labor in God's vineyard, sowing seed, reaping harvest. And I have a word for you: the best is yet to come. Your best days are ahead of you. Praise God. Well, that's a good word for everybody, isn't it? How many take a hold of that? Your best days are yet ahead. When I was, uh, when I was a young Christian, um, I've been in full-time ministry 45 years. I know it's hard to believe, but when you start at age 9, <laughs> you know, uh, 45 years, and, and, you know, I was so on fire for Jesus. I still am. I'm just on fire. And I preached in a lot of little country churches in Arkansas and Oklahoma and Missouri. And uh, I'd go to little churches that even if they did not prophesy, someone would prophesy to me. I hated it. I'd walk into a church and someone would get tuned up. I could see it coming. I could feel it. Someone would prophesy to me. And I was just looking for the back door, you know, because it was the same prophecy. And it just bugged me. I'll do it in an Arkansas accent. Any Arkies here? Well, John can interpret. He's from Missouri, so it's not much difference there. Praise God. Do you know what a New, a New Mexican is? New Mexico, you know what that is? That's an Arkie that never made it to Bakersfield. <laughs> yeah, here's the prophecy. I, I said I'd do this in an Arkansas accident. Yea, says the Lord, I will raise you up in the last days. <laughs> your, your latter days will be greater than your former days, says the Lord. I've given you an end time ministry. When you're 25 years old, you're not thinking about your latter days. But lately, uh, that prophecy seems imminent. I mean, when do you get to be in your latter days? Praise God. Well, I, I just had my 70th birthday, so that qualifies me for something. Yeah, thank you very much. Doing good, feeling strong, good health. Every time I go to the doctor, it makes my wife angry because she exercises and health food and supplements and doesn't eat any junk food. I do everything wrong, and my checkups are always great. But I have a great attitude, hallelujah, and a great God, and confess the word. And the doctors say, they always say the same thing. Wow, your heart is great. Are you an athlete? I almost laugh, you know, like, well, if, if uh, going to church is an Olympic event, yeah, I'm an I'm Olympian there. Praise God. No, I, I do exercise some. Uh, but the Bible says, bodily exercise profiteth little. <laughs> Godliness is profitable into all things. So there's nothing wrong with exercise. And uh, I'm... I think I'm stronger and have more stamina than I had in my 30s. So it's a good thing. You know, God will renew our strength and renew our youth as the eagle. And how many of you believe in God for long life? With long life will I sustain you or satisfy you and show you my salvation. Praise God. That's a good word, isn't it? My grandmother lived to be 100 years old, six months and 18 days. Yeah, and she was a worrier. Talk about a bad confession. She never had anything good to say about anything. If she could have stopped worrying, she might have lived to be 160. I don't know, you know. So anyway, worry will take you out. About 100, 101. <laughs> Praise God. Well, Happy New Year, everyone. Happy 2018. My prayer is this is the best year you've ever had. It is a gift from God. It's a blank slate. You can write on it what you want to. Take the Word of God and engrave that Word on the, on the tables of your life because this is a good year for those who believe God and step out. Praise the Lord. This is not a time 
to get slack. This is not a time to kind of goof off. This is a time really to dig in and, and begin to live the life that we know God has for us and to live it with gusto, to live it with purpose, not just skate, not just kind of drift along from one day to the next, but have a purpose and have a direction. Praise God. You know, men don't like taking directions. Should I be telling this? How many of you that came as a revelation that men don't like taking directions? You ladies knew that, didn't you? I was in Fresno years ago. This is before GPS. And someone wanted to meet my wife and me at Carol's restaurant. So we're driving around in Bakersfield. She said, did you get a, a directions? I said, I don't need directions. She said, do you have an address? I said, I kind of know where it is. She said, why are you like that? Why are you men like that? You are so full of pride. You need to get over yourself and ask for directions. She said, stop right here and ask that man. She pointed at a gas station. So I pulled in. I got out and went over and asked the guy where Carol's was. And he said, right there. <laughs> I think at that moment I sent a prayer to heaven for someone to invent GPS. I've got a Texas-style GPS. I don't know why I'm saying these things. Saturday night, this place looks like a bar anyway, so. <laughs> I saw Mickey Gillies on television. I think this stage is a direct copy of Mickey Gillies there. I don't know. I like it, though. It's nice. So I invented a, a Texas GPS. It's in a man's voice that says, keep driving, boy. Just go in circles. I think you're close. Well, so much of that nonsense. You look way too comfortable. And my job is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Stand back up, please. Yeah. Well, I had a great New Year's Eve. I went to bed about 7 o'clock p.m. Didn't even watch the ball go down on television, you know, East Coast time. Kind of a non-event. A lot of people get really excited about it holidays and things like that. I'm one of those people that's, every day is the same. I'm just glad to be, be alive. Amen? Every day is a good day if you're in Jesus. Whether, Amen. Thank you very much. Praise God. Well, lift your hands up and let me bless you. Father, I'm so thankful for everyone here because I believe we are here by divine guidance. The steps of good men are ordered of the Lord. You ordered this. You arranged this. We could be other places. But we're not other places. We're here now, and there's a reason for it. And it's not just to have a good time. I plan on having a great time. But there's a higher purpose involved. There's direction you want to give us, correction you want for us. You want to correct our course so that we will arrive at our destination and not wander around in the wilderness unnecessarily. So, Father, we thank you for the word of the Lord. It, it gives us direction. Without a vision, people perish. Help us with our vision. Let us see what's ahead. The Holy Spirit goes before us and prepares a way for us. We thank you that you have a plan. And we want to be doing that plan from the heart and not just coasting through life. Life is too important and too precious to take it for granted. We need to seize every moment. So we acknowledge you and we invite your presence in. Church, just kind of feel after him if you, if you can. He's right here. We're in his presence. Where two or three are gathered, he's present. He's here. He's walking the aisles. He's breathing upon us. He's whispering to our hearts. He is here to show himself strong, to confirm his word with signs and wonders and miracles. I believe in miracles. I serve a God of miracles, a miracle-working God. Nothing is impossible with God. All things are possible. I thank you for doing the impossible here tonight. Do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And thank you for anointing me to stand in the office you've called me to. And I'll do my best to say what you want me to say and obey you fully in Jesus' name. I want you to say, let's say this in unity. 
For the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. For the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. For the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. For the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. For the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. For the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. For the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. Give him another hand clap. He's worthy. The Lord is good and his mercy does endure forever. Praise God. The Bible says he is rich in mercy. And he's not stingy with it. He is lavish with his mercy. And we can come boldly into his holy of holies to receive help and mercy in our time of need. I don't know about you, but tonight I want to have a holy of holies experience. The outer court is good. The sanctuary is wonderful, but the Holy of Holies is our destination. Lift your hands one more time, and may He impart into you the anointing of God that removes burdens, destroys yoke, sets captives free, and empowers you for service unto Him. Thank you for removing all the weights and all the yokes and all the bondages from our minds, from our memories, from our soul. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The Lord put something, I believe, that's uh, timely and important on my heart uh, to, to bring to Believer's Church this weekend, tonight, tomorrow, uh, a.m. and tomorrow afternoon. And it's really just three parts, one, two, three. They're all connected. Uh, I'm going to lay a little foundation tonight. I'm not going to preach long. I'm going to continue tomorrow, and then I'll finish it up tomorrow night. Also, I have a, a what I think is a very exciting uh, announcement to make tomorrow, and I'll just wait until we have a few more of the regulars here because I think everyone would like to hear this firsthand, so um, just whet your appetite a little bit. There's a, a great announcement that's going to take place tomorrow. I have a friend in Texas, Bob Gloris. He and I have been friends for quite a few years now, and he's an aircraft uh, mechanic. A and P, and uh, great guy, loves God, one of the most generous people that I've ever known with his time and everything he has, loves uh, loves me, just so committed to me, and uh, every time I'm in Texas, he will not allow me to stay anywhere but with him, no hotel, no motel, I've got to stay with him, and he's got the prophet's quarters fixed up, I mean, they are, it, it is really nice. And uh, on top of that, he, he, he stops everything he's doing. He stops his work. He stops his business. And he either flies me around where I want to go or drives me around where I want to go and just makes sure that, I mean, his hospitality is really, really great. And I am his friend, but I'm also his prophet. And he's got enough maturity to know the difference. Some people won't let me be Larry. I'm, I've always got to be in the prophet's role, the prophet's hat, and, and that's not realistic. You know, we're human beings. Yes, there's a divine call, and yes, there's an anointing, and as the Lord moves upon us and speaks, when we step over in that, I mean, even my wife kind of, uh, you know, kowtows a little when I step over into that role because she realizes it's not Larry anymore. It's the office in which I stand, and God's using me at that moment. So Bob, um, Bob was involved in a trading program. There was a, a gentleman that was investing people's money for them in stock and futures and that kind of thing. He had a trading program that was pretty well computer driven and uh, showing a lot of profits. And everyone who put money in his hands to invest started making dividends just hand over fist. Well, my friend Bob got involved in it and started getting dividends, and he got excited, and he put more money in it, and he got more money out of it, and other people jumped in. A lot of preachers jumped in on it. I don't know how that happened, but there was some buzz, so you'd be surprised at the, the well-named preachers that got in on this trading program. And uh, I thought it was great because Bob was happy, 
he's making money, and uh, he's a supporter of my ministry, so some of that money was going into my ministry, which I appreciate. And one day I gave him a call, and I said, Bob, get out of that program as quickly as you can. He said, what? I said, Bob, this is not Larry talking. This is your prophet. Get out of that program. Pull your money out as quickly as you can. He said, are you sure? I said, I'm as serious as a heart attack. Well, he said, well, let me make a call. So he called his broker, asked him a few questions, and he called me back, and he said, I want to ask you one more time. Are you sure? He's making a lot of money. And I said, Bob, you've got to get your money out of there now. Do not hesitate. So he called his broker back, and the broker said, well, I can, uh, I can, I can cut you a cashier's check on Wednesday. Now, this was a Friday when I made the call to Bob. Saturday, I had a conversation with his broker. Broker says Wednesday. Monday, that broker was in a very suspicious single pilot, single plane accident and perished. I know for a fact it was suicide by airplane. His business was a Ponzi scheme, classic Ponzi scheme. It was not making money. They were taking new investors' money and giving, you know how that works, giving part of the dividend to the old investors, keeping them happy and, and kind of moving, leapfrogging uh, forward. And the SEC was doing a soft investi investigation on him. The FBI was doing a soft investigation. And um, uh, IRS independent of one another. Now, no one knew this except for me, by the Spirit of the Lord. And I gave Bob his warning. And the good news is a lot of people lost all their money. Bob doubled his money. <laughs> and it wasn't a huge amount, but it would be big to you or me maybe. He, he wound up with $250,000 free and clear. The SEC can't find the money, the, the rest of the money that went missing. The FBI couldn't find it, and the IRS couldn't find it. There is a scripture that says, believe the prophets, and so you shall prosper. The operative word there is believe. I mean, if we're doubtful and cynical, uh, that promise doesn't belong to us. But if we're believing believers, I think some people need to revisit the idea of faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the rhema of God, which is the prophetic release of God's Word. Not just the rote, not just the academic, but the God-breathed, Holy Spirit-inspired Word. How many times have you ever read a familiar scripture, but the Holy Spirit breathed on it, and it was a word to you? Praise God. Rhema. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every rhema that comes out of the mouth of God. Jesus said, if you abide in me and my rhema abides in you, you can ask what you will and it shall be done. The God-breathed, God-inspired prophetic word creates Holy Ghost faith on the inside of us. A gift of faith is released when we receive a word from the Lord. Believe the Lord and you shall be established. Believe His prophets and you shall prosper. I want to read a familiar scripture by Jesus. This is my text for the next three days. It's in uh, Matthew chapter 10. Praise God. Let me open up my electronic Bible here. Tonight I'm going to talk about, uh, let me get this open. Sorry about that. Just for appearance only. The words appear more clear. <laughs> I think they make me look smart. I don't know. You know. Hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> Bigger fonts. Thank you. Um, he that receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. The Amplified Bible says he that receives a prophet because he is a prophet. 
you're mature enough and realistic enough and experienced enough to realize that not everyone who says he's a prophet is a prophet. In fact, Jesus said there will be many false prophets who will arise and deceive many. He didn't say a few. He didn't say occasionally. Many. More than you think. The majority of so-called self-styled appointed prophets are probably spurious prophets. Now the word false seems very evil. You hear that word false prophet. Maybe a better word would be spurious. Someone lied to them and told them they were a prophet and they believed it. And I don't doubt the sincerity. I know there are some nefarious and evil characters out there who are manipulating and deceiving on purpose. But let me tell you something. People who are deceived will deceive others. Not necessarily because they're trying to pull the wool over their eyes, but it's a case of the blind leading the blind. And deception produces deception. A lot of people think they're listening to God. They're not listening to God. A lot of people think that they're following after the Holy Spirit. They're not following after the, the Holy Spirit. And so you know that. So I believe that's why Jesus said, receive a prophet because he is a prophet. And you get the prophet's reward. The Bible says, know them that labor among you. We know them by their fruit. Um, as I said earlier, this is my 45th year of full-time ministry, prophetic ministry. There was not a day when, you know, a burning bush came to me and <laughs> appeared and, and God said, I've called you to be a prophet. That, that didn't happen. The dreams and visions and prophecies began the day I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. The day I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, and I thought that's how everyone was. I mean, I was constantly in the glory and just experiencing wonderful things, and God talking to me and showing me things. And, uh, I've lived my life by revelation, by listening to the Spirit of God, by following the Spirit of God. There are a few stories. I've got, who knows, maybe 10,000 stories and testimonies but there are a few that stand out. And, and one of them that's interesting, and the reason I like to give this testimony is, number one, it's dramatic, and number two, it helps me explain how the ministry of the prophet works in my life. I was in Mexico at a meeting that was, uh, several churches came together and had invited me to minister to them, and it was full house. And there was a lot of rigmarole that went on at the front end of the meeting, you know, a lot of uh, business that had to be taken care of and announcements and people giving little talks. And, you know, they wanted every preacher there to take two minutes. You know what that means. <laughs> it means I got the microphone about 10 o'clock at night. And here's what I said. I said, you have to listen very carefully to what I'm about to say. It's important, for I have a word from the Lord, and I do not have long to give this word. For in a moment, the wind is going to blow, and the electricity is going to go off, and we're going to have no lights and no microphone. And I gave the word. It's a very simple word. Signs and wonders over Mexico, even luminous clouds of God's supernatural glory. And when I said, thus saith the Lord, the wind blew indoors, the electricity went off, and the lights, the room went dark and no sound. Just like that. You know, there's a scripture that says, if you prophesy, prophesy according to the proportion of your faith. There are some prophecies that are kind of safe. You know, I could say, someone here is suffering from hemorrhoids. And there are different ways to say that. <laughs> I'm not even going to look at Pastor John because I'm going to lose it. I'm 
stuck on that. I'm just going to say get it over with. Some people here have a pain in the rear or are a pain in the rear. One fellow wrote me from, from uh, Australia. He's a prophet. And he said, uh, the Lord has shown me that something is going to happen this year somewhere. He said, I don't know what or when or where, but something is going to happen. Wow, doesn't that just give you cold chills? How did he know that? <laughs> but when you have the confidence to say, right after I give this word, the wind is going to blow. The lights are going to go out you better know that you've heard from God or that might be the end of your ministry in Mexico. There are only so many places left if, you, if people keep spouting off spurious prophecies that do not come to pass or to follow as the prophet said. There's one famous prophet used to cycle through the Bay Area a lot and I was talking to the pastor one day who was a tremendous uh, uh, friend and supporter of this guy and he said yeah I asked him one day how many of his prophecies came to pass how many words he gave a lot of words to people and the fellow said about 50 percent and I was talking to one of the board members and I mentioned that I said you know pastor says that guy uh, admits that only about 50 percent of those words come to pass he said you mean 0.05 I don't understand that. I don't know. I don't know how a person can say, "Thus saith the Lord," if it's not "Thus saith the Lord." I, I mean, my fear of God is too, too great for that. I mean, I'm afraid even to to miss it accidentally, much less on purpose, just to randomly say things, and to manipulate people, to manipulate their their feelings and their hopes. I've said this for years. I'm a decent Bible teacher. I don't have to prophesy. I can always teach the word, and that is a sure word of prophecy. The only, the only time I'm going to open up my mouth and say, thus saith the Lord, is if God has given me a word. Praise God. Receive a prophet because he is a prophet, and you'll get the prophet's reward. That that. That word with the uh, winds going to blow is pretty dramatic. And um, in the dark, we started singing in, in tongues. because We had no microphone, no light, so we just started singing in the spirit. The whole congregation picked up the spiritual song. It was beautiful. It went on for 40, 45 minutes. And while we're singing, people started going outside. And I noticed through the open doorway, when they stepped outside, they would look up, shout, fall on their knees or their faces. And I watched that happen over and over. People walk out the door, throw their hands up, fall on their faces, shouting to God. So I got real curious. I walked out there. And above the Children's Church Annex, which was a building at right angles with the sanctuary, there was a red, luminous, columnar cloud that started right above the peak of the roof and went up into the sky hundreds of feet. And it was definitely heaven, heavenly. It was, it was like looking at the glory, I suppose, above the Ark of the Covenant. You know, a pillar by day and fire by night. And while that cloud manifested, every child in the children's church, from the toddlers to the teens, were baptized in the Holy Ghost, slain under the power, praying in tongues, prophesying. I mean, they had an Azusa Street Pentecostal experience. Luminous clouds of preternatural glory. Come on, let's lift our hands and thank God. Praise God. Praise God. The prophet declares the wonderful works of God. The prophet helps people see Jesus. The prophet helps magnify the Lord and the word of the Lord. The prophet helps give people a further revelation of Jesus. The number one job of the prophet is not to predict the next earthquake in California or the next tornado in Kansas or the next hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico. You can, you can throw a dart at a map and be accurate pretty often because we know there are going to be earthquakes in California and we know there are going to be 
tornadoes. That's not the number one reason we have prophecy. The number one reason we have prophecy is to build up the saints, to encourage the saints, to strengthen the saints, to equip the saints, to help the saints. Praise God. There are no Old Testament prophets left. The last one was John the Baptist. Jesus said he was the greatest. But the least in the kingdom is greater than he. Why? Because he didn't have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And you do. That's why God's sons and daughters can prophesy and magnify God because we're baptized with the Holy Spirit. We're born again uh, of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. John the Baptist didn't have that. John the Baptist got his head cut off. And when John the Baptist went to Herod's prison with the death sentence, Jesus, when, it, when he went south, Jesus went north to Galilee. And John is languishing in the prison knowing that he's going to be executed. And he sends word to Jesus, are you the one? Wait a second, you know he's the one. You're the forerunner. Or should we look for another? You know what his problem was? He was offended. Jesus said, blessed is he who's not offended in me. He put his finger right on it. John was offended. What was he offended at? He's going to die. Jesus is going to increase. He's come to the end of his ministry. The Old Testament is coming to an end. The Levitical priesthood is coming to an end. That succession of Old Testament prophets of judgment and doom and gloom are coming to an end. And now there's a new covenant. God has a new way of doing things. He's filling his people with his Holy Spirit. He's releasing the word of grace and the word of faith upon the earth. And there's no place left for the old priesthood. Jesus was not from the tribe of Levi. He's from the tribe of Judah. Hallelujah. He never wore the priestly ephods and garments. He didn't wear the rabbinical robes. He was a king. He wore red robes. They were dyed in the blood of grapes. Read the Bible. It wasn't like the Bible when they show him in in tattered clothes with a, a carpenter's wooden kid over his shoulder, walking through town wanting to fi fix somebody's sheep pen. And it's not him at all. Praise God. Even blind Bartimaeus had enough sense to call him son of David, king of Israel. Praise God. Lift your hands up. Thank God for the King. Open wide ye gates. Open ye everlasting doors. And the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. Mighty, mighty in battle. Praise God. God wants to come into your world this year. God wants to change things this year. God wants to empower you this year. He wants to breathe into you a fresh anointing. Praise God. Get your second wind. Get blowing and going again. Praise God. Hallelujah. Breathe on us, Holy Spirit. Breathe on us tonight. In Jesus' name. He that receiveth the prophet in the name of the prophet shall receive the prophet's reward. And that word reward means wages are pay for a service that's rendered. This is a conditional promise. We cannot claim the prophet's blessing if we haven't done our part. Number one, we have to receive the prophet. That is proactive. The onus is on you and me to recognize the prophet to do our vetting and make sure we know who the true prophets and the false prophets are, and then make a conscious decision to receive that man or that woman, that gift. A lot of people window shop prophets, you know, like the flavor of the month. The Internet will mess your mind up. There is no end to the information there it is a Pandora's box of ideas that has been released on the world. And people come up with all kinds of cockamamie ideas, but they saw it on the Internet. Well, it's got to be true if it's on the Internet. Well, let's have some discernment. Let's be careful what we're, what we're feeding upon and who we're allowing to feed us. 
Praise God. Receive a prophet because he is a prophet. That word prophet has several shades of meaning, I mean uh, receive, and it's, uh, it's the word uh, dekomai, dekomai. And the first shade of meaning is hospitality. Be hospitable to the prophet. Make the prophet feel welcome. Make him feel at home. The prophet has needs. The prophet needs a place to lay his head. The prophet needs uh, food and shelter and human companionship, just like every other mortal upon this earth. And a person who knows how to be hospitable to the prophet and entertain the prophet stands a very good chance of getting the prophet's reward. But if we're rude to the prophet and we're, we're, we're closed off to the prophet, and we're skeptical of the prophet, at some point you have to open your heart. You have to go through that process of vetting and making sure. And then once you are, we need to learn how to throw the doors open and embrace wholeheartedly. A second meaning of the word receive is to embrace as a friend, as a companion, as a brother. Another, another shade of meaning is to hold on to and not let go, to grab a hold of them. You know, Jesus said, are you going to leave me? And they said, where would we go? How many times have you read in the Bible where someone grabbed a hold of the prophet's feet and said, I'm not letting go until you bless me? This idea of, of taking a hold of it, it's not just casual. It's not just passive. Well, we'll see if this person has anything. We'll see if they can pull any rabbits out of a hat, if they, can, if they can impress me or something like that. And then we have our list and we compare prophets. Maybe it would be a good idea if we had, like, prophet baseball cards. Wouldn't that be cool? So we can kind of trade cards instead of RBIs and that sort of thing, and how many people raised from the dead. I don't know. That's a silly idea, isn't it? But sometimes it becomes a, 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 almost a celebrity thing. You know, certain people get elevated and promoted to the point where they're no longer mere human beings. No, no, no. We're very earthy. We're very real in, in many ways, <laughs> um, more real than others. The, the, a real prophet is probably the least phony person you're ever going to meet. This prophet is prophesying to someone. He says, the Lord says you're fat. And they said, I want a second opinion. He says, you're ugly too. I was, prophesy I was prophesying to this red-headed kid, and I don't know why I was doing it to him. He's a teenager, and I'm slapping him upside of the head saying, Think, Jimmy Neutron, think! <laughs> Two or three of you got, got that one. <laughs> Praise God. Yeah, we need to be real. Hospitality, embracing. It also means to claim something. He that receiveth, claim something. You see that gift in operation, claim it. Don't be just passive. Go after it. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, they shall be filled. Too many, too many Christians are, I, I don't know what it is about us, maybe we're just too nice and we're just kind of, you know, well, maybe it'll rain pennies out of heaven and a few of them will fall our way. You know, we don't want to be too greedy. We don't want to overreach ourselves. Would you get delivered from that? It's God's good pleasure to give you His kingdom. Hallelujah. He will in no wise withhold any good thing from them who walk uprightly. God wants to bless you. Paul said, do not do despite to the grace of God. You know what that means? Don't insult the grace of God. Don't insult His goodness. Don't insult His generosity. Don't insult His ability. Don't insult His kindness. There's an old proverb that says, you never ask a king for a penny. Why? That would be an insult. Ask Him something worthy of a king. A king can do something for you that no one else. Why would you ask the king to do something that anybody and everybody could do? Put a demand upon His kingly authority. I'll give you an example. When I lived in Mexico, I was trying to get my resident visa, and I was going through the immigration process, and it took several years and a lot of money, and it was tedious, and, and my attorney was... Funny story about the attorney. I'll tell it one day. I'll just tell it now. I was running out of patience with him. I sat him down. I said, you are not really trying to help me get my visa. Oh, yeah, 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 I am. 
I said, no, you're not. You're lazy. You're not doing anything. I said, this is important. My life and ministry hang on this. And I said, you better get with it, buddy. If you don't, I'm going to pray that you can't sleep at night. God is going to take sleep away from you until you get busy and start working for me. And I said, if you don't get busy and that doesn't work, I'm going to pray that you can't eat. Your food will not agree with you. You're going to lose your appetite. Kind of going Old Testament on him a little bit here, you know. <laughs> and I said, if that doesn't work, I'm going to pray that your wife becomes uninterested in you and she never touches you again. He said, please don't pray that. I will get busy. <laughs> I knew there was something that was going to push his button, you know, just keep pushing enough buttons. So I'm going through this immigration process, and it is, it is just so terrible. Over two years. My next door neighbor was Dr. Juan Hernandez, who worked for President Vicente Fox, their best friends. He was Vicente Fox's campaign manager, and then after that, his chief advisor. I'm chatting with Dr. Hernandez. He said, how's the immigration going? I said, oh man, we are stonewalled every time we turn around. And he said, yeah. He said, I'm sorry about my country, but it's that way. He said, why don't you let me make a call for you? He said, I can usually get some things moving. I said, Dr. Hernandez, I don't want to trouble you with my problems. You're doing important things, and I don't want to trouble you. He looked at me and gave me a strange look. We went home, and my wife said, you insulted Dr. Hernandez. I said, what do you mean I insulted him? She said, he graciously offered to help you, and you told him, no, that's an insult. Oh. So I called him up. I said, can I come back and talk to you? I said, Dr. Hernandez, I owe you an apology. I insulted you. I don't know what it is, false humility or what, but in all sincerity, you offered to help, and if, if the offer is still there, I need it. The next day, I was in the Mexican White House called Los Pinos. I'm in President Vicente Fox's office, and the office of the president called the office of the immigration, and that day, I had my visa. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. If you're going to ask, ask for something big. Amen. Praise the Lord. Don't be mealy-mouthed. You are a first-class citizen of heaven. You're a holy nation, a royal priesthood. God has made you accepted in the beloved. You are worthy. We sing about being unworthy in this and that. That's the old unborn again, dead in sin. We are new creatures in Christ, old things have passed away, everything has become new. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. Lift your righteous hand and give God a righteous praise. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. You have not because you hast not. Be bold. Ask for something big this year. A lot of times I see people asking God to do things for them that they can do for themselves. You don't need a miracle to bend over and tie your shoes if you're an able-bodied person. But if you can't walk, you need a miracle. Praise the Lord. I'm going to have you stand up with me. One more meaning of the word receive is to make it your own. To make it your own. To make it your own. You know, Christians are confused today. Most Christians know who their pastor is. But there are a lot of them who don't. They don't have a shepherd. They're not accountable to anyone. They have not submitted and committed they're not in a local body. They don't have an overseer. That's called rebellion, you know, which is the sin of witchcraft, and it's an abomination. God has given us shepherds, and we need to obey those that have the rule over us. But most intelligent people who love God have an understanding of who their pastor is. They can point to a man or woman and say, that's my pastor. 
And you may be keenly aware of their faults and shortcomings, but you recognize a treasure in an earthen vessel, a divine calling, a mantle, and you have committed yourself to that anointing, to that mantle, and to the person who carries it. But almost no one, it's statistically rare for anyone to be able to point to a man or a woman and say, that's my prophet. And yet, God has set in the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers for the edifying of the church to do the work of the ministry. God has set in the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. And each one has a job description. Each one is important. God couldn't do it all with just a pastor. He couldn't do it all with just an apostle. He couldn't do it all. He needed the five-fold ministry to be able to manifest the five-fold ministry of Jesus, of the apostle and the prophet and the teacher and so forth. And if God has set in the church prophets, don't you think it's important to him that we recognize what he's done and we acknowledge it? It's not my idea. I didn't invent the concept. I wouldn't have even dreamt of it. I wouldn't have liked it. I'm not too sure I like it anyway. But since God has set in the church, and since we are submitted to God and we want to please God, then we need to accept that as a fact. And the word receive means to make him your own. The Shunammite woman knew who her prophet was. The Shunammite woman knew that he had needs. The Shunammite woman built him a, a penthouse on the wall. Hallelujah. The Shunammite woman furnished it and put food and board and larder there. The Shunammite woman took care of the man of God, and every time he came through Shunam, he had a place to stay. Hallelujah. And then when the prophet asked her what she needed, Gehazi said she has no child, and the prophet blessed her, and she gave birth to a baby boy. And then when the boy grew up, he had an accident and he died. But she had a relationship and she knew who her prophet was and she shot, saddled her donkey and she rode to the prophet of God and by the Spirit of God, he raised that young man from the dead. Hallelujah. She knew who her prophet was. And the prophet said, there's going to be a famine for seven years. Go dwell among the Philistines. And God's pr provided and sustained her for seven years of famine. Hallelujah. And when she came back, she found out that a bunch of people were squatting on her prophet Property, and Gehazi was talking to the king and he said that's a woman that Elisha raised her son from the dead and the king appointed officers listen 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 to go back and put her on her possession on her promised land and to restore everything that the enemy had consumed for seven years is anybody listening to the spirit of god here god is appointing heavenly officers to supervise your business and to go back and recover your property and recover your money and recover your good name and recover your innocence and recover your reputation hallelujah somebody here ought to give god a praise Hallelujah! All of that was based upon her meeting the basic conditions. She had received her prophet. She knew who her prophet was. It's not a show. It's not a popularity contest. To tell you the truth, I don't prophesy that much probably prophesy the least of all the prophets I know. But, you know, my batting average is real good. <laughs> That's real good. See, it's like the thing with the wind. So how'd you know that was going to happen? I didn't. Because I know what Jesus said to me, and I just said what he said. That's all there is to it. You just got to be close enough to Jesus he can whisper in this ear and it'll come out your mouth. Hallelujah. Praise God. There's a word coming for us tonight. Praise the Lord. There's a word coming for you tonight. You can, you can passively, mentally agree with it. Yeah, yeah, that's a great word. Or you can actively possess it. That second word, receive, 
means to seize and to hold it by force, to not let anybody tear it out of your hand. Paul had to tell Timothy, remember the prophecies that were spoken over thee. It's a warfare. A lot of people get a word from the Lord and they think, well, everything's going to change in the next five minutes. It may be the next five months. It may be the next five years. But if you'll hold on to that word, praise God, things are going to change. Praise God. And if it's a word from the Lord, there's no shelf life on it. It's still true today. Hold on to that word and don't let unbelief take it away from you. Don't let the devil talk you out of it. Don't let your, your you know, Job comforting friends talk you out of it. Hold on to that word. I know the Lord has spoken to me and I'm going to hold on to this word. Praise God. He's going to raise me up in the latter days. Hallelujah. My latter days will be greater than my former days, says the Lord. There's a 45-year-old word. It's still as real today as it's ever been in my life. I ain't going to let it go. Hallelujah. Praise God. Maybe you have a word that someone spoke over you, and at the time you had the witness. It's what you were believing for. You knew it's from God, but sometimes we forget. Sometimes we get weary in well-doing. And sometimes it's exactly right. We have to write the vision down. Praise God. Let's have our piano player come back up here. I worked myself into a sweat. I thought it was supposed to be winter. Hallelujah. I think I think that Stevie Wonder could prophesy what I'm about ready to prophesy. Change, 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 change. This is a year of change. Things are going to be rearranged. Nothing is going to be the same. If you're not flexible, if you're not willing to go with the glory of God, you shall be left behind in a fog. But for those who will follow my spirit, it's going to be brighter and clearer Every day, change, change, change is coming your way. Changes in the political landscape, changes in religion, changes geographically, changes in the weather, changes of all shapes and sizes all around the world. It's coming, says the Lord, but it's not a thing to fear, dread, Everything's going to work out good, just as I've said. If you'll trust me, I'll guide you, I'll get you through, and you will be amazed at the things that you and I shall do. Lift your hands and thank God. you got to embrace the change. you got to embrace the change. you got to embrace the change. When the Bible says, receive the word of the prophet, it means for good or for bad. Sometimes there's a word of encouragement. Sometimes there's a word of correction. Sometimes it builds you up, and sometimes it kind of tears you down so that you can be built upon a stronger foundation. Don't be like concrete, thoroughly mixed up and totally set. Be like putty. Be like clay. For God can mold you and make you and change you step by step, day by day. Change, change, change. I want you to say, change me, Lord. Change my heart. Change my motives. Change my expectations. Change my mind. Make it more like you. Change me, Lord. You have to ask yourself this question, do you trust God? Do you really trust Him with your life and your future? What if He asked you to do something that was you've never experienced before? What if he asked you to step out of the boat, so to speak? What if he asked you to go someplace you've never been? What if he asked you to give or sacrifice or serve 
beyond your comfort zone. We say we want change. Do you really? Do you really? I don't know who first said it, but the only thing that stays the same is change. You are being changed from one degree of radiant holiness to the next by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is changing you. The Spirit of God is taking you apart and putting you back together better. Hallelujah. The Spirit of God is making some adjustments. He's knocking some barnacles off of your boat. Hallelujah. He's trimming some suckers and sappers off of your true vine. Hallelujah. He's digging and dunging. He is making changes. Every tree that produces fruit, He purges it so that it can produce more fruit. Hallelujah. Praise God. Here's part two for 2018 for those who are willing to change more and more and more than you've ever had before more of everything good more of everything true God's got much more in store for me and you more of his glory more truth more revelation more power more authority more liberty you'll be free more than you've ever been, more love, more joy, more boldness, more courage, and get this, more prosperity and a better life. God's got more just in sight. Hey, you got those words and some have been on the shelf 10 years, 20 years, but you never let go. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Take hold. Seize it violently and don't let go. Remember those prophecies that were prophesied over thee. Darren Goodman, remember those prophecies that were prophesied over you and drop. Praise God. Hallelujah. Remember those prophecies. Some of them are going to be bubbling back up to the surface because you've been busy doing a lot of things occupied but God's going to start reminding you of things he told you long ago not so long ago and even in recent years it's all going to come to pass all you have to do is hold fast <laughs> don't let go Make a fist. Don't let go. I'm taking hold of my promises. And I won't let go. I'm taking hold. I'm taking hold. I'm taking hold. Ah, uh, the Lord, the Lord is I'll talk a little bit more about this tomorrow, God willing. But one of the things the Lord is going to be releasing in a, in a figure it's like he's broken another seal on another scroll and he's releasing revelation knowledge and those who are willing to step out you're going to move in a in a realm of revelation knowledge that few people have moved into and it's not going to be fantastic it's going to be practical and it'll be productive and you'll do more by the Spirit of God than other people will ever do just by the force of their strength and personality. Because God's going to show you ways to do things, to accomplish His will with less effort. Somebody needs to take a hold of that. More with less effort. Revelation knowledge. Wisdom is profitable to direct. If your heart is hungry for real real wisdom and real information from above lift both hands wisdom is the principal thing with all you're getting get wisdom get understanding praise God seek and you shall find knock and the door shall be open ask and you'll receive wisdom is the principal thing let no man despise your youth be an example in word and deed. Ha ha. Sebo suba hando lobo sikidi bonda. Ha ha. I don't do this very often, but I, I feel led to have a, 
an altar time in just a moment where we come up and we spend a few minutes in the presence of God. But I want before we do that, I want you to sit down. You know without saying that the gospel is free. You know that. And some people take that to mean that, well, they're never going to participate because they don't want to be merchandising or buying the anointing. I understand. You've got you to have that balanced. But there's another side to that. They that live, uh, uh, they that serve at the altar, live by the altar. The, the priesthood didn't go out to secular jobs. Their job was being a priest. And they were supported financially. It's not hard to understand. They that labor in the Word are deserving of double honor. We've sown spiritual things. We have a right to expect natural things. This is how the kingdom works. To receive a prophet means to sustain or support or to contribute to the livelihood of that prophet his ministry, his family, and so forth. It's irrational to think that we're going to be blessed by refusing to obey the Word. It's irrational to resist God and His way of doing things. He said, here's how it works. You receive the prophet, you get the prophet's reward. What does that mean? If you don't receive the prophet, you don't get the prophet's reward. So really the onus is on us as individuals. How committed are we to doing the Word of God? The best way I could help you right now is to have you sow into the prophet's ministry. So why would that help me? <laughs> because it puts you in position to get the prophet's reward, which is something I couldn't do for you personally, but God will do it for you, hallelujah, supernaturally. I used to fuss at God. Every time Pastor's Appreciation Day came along, I got a bad attitude. These congregations are sending their pastor off on vacation, and buying him a new car, and, you know, taking him shopping, and taking up a offering for him. And I used to tell God, there is no Prophet's Appreciation Day. I even tried to organize a movement to start Prophets Appreciation Day. Of course, I was going to be the chairman. And one day the Lord said, oh, I got something a lot better than the Prophets Appreciation Day. I said, what's that? And he said, the Prophets Reward. Praise God. Hallelujah. I'm not complaining ever again. Praise God. God has a system set up to sustain the prophet in his ministry. And I like his way of doing things. Bow your heads and close your eyes. And I want you to ask the Holy Spirit what kind of a seed he wants you to sow into your reward. This is your reward you're sowing into. What kind of seed does the Lord of the harvest want you to sow so that you can receive your reward? What's he asking you to do? What's he challenging you to do? How important is change in your life? Are you willing to get out of your comfort zone? Heavenly Father, I thank you for the Holy Spirit who communicates to all of us in a way that we can understand. You talk to different people different ways at different times. But I know that right now you are communicating might be verbal or nonverbal. It might be visual. It might be an impression. But you are communicating. And as we obey you, it's going to produce a harvest of blessings in our lives. The prophet's reward. The prophet's reward. Praise the Well, the... Um, Men and women of valor are going to walk among you. If you're making out a check, make it out to believers.
Pastor John will transfer that over to uh, my ministry. I've been receiving offerings out of this congregation for whoo, a long time. There's no telling how many thousands of dollars believers have put into my ministry over the years, and I want to tell you I appreciate that. Some of you in this room have gone uh, above and beyond to bless our ministry. I want to thank you for that. I do not take it for granted. Did you ever hear the joke where if you get two numbers, you add them together? That's not biblical. God multiplies. I want to tell you what, vanity is a terrible thing. I went on a diet, lost some weight, got to where I could almost wear this jacket again. I thought I'd show off a little, and I am so hot right now, I'm sweating like a stuck pig. I didn't need that pride anyway. Let me tell you how I got this jacket. One of my partners called me, he's uh, from Uganda. Ambassador, I want to buy you clothes. Sorry about my Texas uh, Ghanaian accent. I said, Usain, I'm hard to buy clothes for. I'm 46XL, T. I'm going to buy you clothes. Next day, he drives up in a minivan, and he offloads 13 suits and sports coats and trousers. 13. 13. How much more will your heavenly Father clothe you? I'm actually prophesying to Karen over here. <laughs> Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. You got to be here tomorrow. Got a word for you. You got to be here tomorrow. Evening's good. You got to be back. Yeah. You got to come. Can you come back tomorrow? All right. Be, do that. Yeah, today, uh, today I'm just kind of, just kind of setting up the subject a little bit, clearing out the underbrush. We're going to knock down some big trees tomorrow. All right, if you're ready to give, let's go ahead and and uh, obey God in our giving. And the moment you release this, it has left your life and it's gone into your future. And the miracle is starting. The moment you release this, the moment you release it, it's not active until you release it. So release it in faith, release it with joy, and expect a harvest. And hold on to that promise of change in 2018. I just want to take a minute to say this because <clears throat> some of you are not going to be able to be here tomorrow. Uh, about a month ago, we were having prayer on Wednesday night, and uh, as soon as I sat down to pray, in my spirit, I was aware of a whirlwind, tornado whirlwind-looking type thing that was right on this pulpit right here. And I said, Lord, what is that? He said, that's an angel. And I said, it's an angel. Yes, he said, it's an angel called the winds of change. And uh, he began to talk to me about, and my son, Mike, had had a, a uh, vision or revelation of that type of a thing, the whirlwind type thing, on each state of the map of the United States. And uh, everything Brother Larry has said tonight, has, it was just confirmation to me. And the way we're going to change is by revelation. We're going to go with that because God's going to reveal things to us. And there's more to it, but I just wanted to say that tonight. That we are in a, we've got to pay attention. We've got to be willing to move. We've got to arise and shine, and that's the way we're going to arise and shine, is by revelation, by the Holy Spirit, because everything's changing in this world, and the body of Christ needs to change and become the answer in this day. But I just wanted to share that. Um, I, I hope that I have time tomorrow to talk about a, 
something that happened to me again in Mexico that has to do with the winds of change. It was Book of Acts type of miracle. It was more than a miracle. It was a sign and a wonder. And uh, it's very much along the line of what you just shared about the whirlwind. Here's my concern. Is that people will be caught up in a spurious move that's not of God. A move of man. It's organized by men, plotted and planned by men, charted by men. There are a lot of smart people who are always casting visions and plans and programs. And thousands of people get swept up into these good ideas, but they're not God ideas. I was very concerned about the elections because I saw Christians becoming very angry and divisive over politics, conservatism versus liberalism. And the Bible says that a soldier of Christ does not entangle himself in the affairs of this world system. I know there's a balance there. We need to be patriots and participate in our, in our government. But we also have to keep our heads screwed on straight and walk in love and walk in mercy, and walk in unity and not allow a sort of division to come into our churches. I like to leave all the politics outside. I have never in my lifetime preached a political message, and I never will. I have never in my lifetime opened up one of my pulpits to a politician. No matter what their platform is, no matter what their stance, because this is sacred and this is a prophetic platform. There are other venues to talk about politics. There are other opportunities. This is holy ground. That's just me. That might rub some people the wrong way, but I don't want to see people get caught up in a, in, in a political morass that's going to blind us to what God's doing. Anger and hate, prejudice, it's blinding. Got to walk in love. Not just towards the brethren, but to those who are on the outside. And the second thing that bothers me is people getting caught up in, in religion. Religion is bondage. I, I, I don't think I have to explain what I mean when I say religion. I'm talking about dead works. I'm talking about ritual. I'm talking about rote. I'm talking about traditions. I'm talking about a religious mindset and, and a religious type of a lifestyle that really is uh, very, very limiting. If we're born of the Spirit, we ought to also walk in the Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. I've had all the religion I want in one lifetime. How about you? I'm not irreligious. I'm not on a crusade. I am pro-Holy Spirit. Praise God. Somebody asked me recently, he said, you don't preach much about hell. I said, I got so many more good things to preach about. You know, I believe in hell, but wow. There's so much to enjoy about being in Christ. Hallelujah. Hell's a real good message to preach to sinners. For the rest of it, it's kind of just like a history lesson. You know, we know it, but we're not really too worried about hell. That's just me. And the other thing that, that has me worried is Christians who are buying into every conspiracy theory that comes across the Internet. Those are not chemical trails. Those are contrails. The fog on the mountain isn't some sort of a, 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 you know, a genetic gas that's going to change your DNA. It's called fog. And none of your antichrist were the right antichrist, all right? The antichrist is going to be smart. (laughs) 
don't trouble your mind with all that kind of stuff, that what if, fantastic, you need to learn how to live right here, right now. Now faith is. Amen? Stand to your feet. If you, if, if, if you need to go, this would be a good time for you to make a quiet exit. Um, but if you are sincere about you changing, we'll start with us. Then I'm going to ask you to give God opportunity to begin working. And the best time to do it is now while the iron's hot. Close your eyes and bow your heads. If you're here and you're tired of the status quo, you don't want to live a repeat of last year or the last decade. You don't want to be dealing with the same things this year that you dealt with last year. You're ready to move into something better. We are changed by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is here. I'm going to invite you as your heart, as your heart moves you to just come on up here and present yourself to God and just start tonight saying, Lord, you, you have permission to start changing me. Change my mind, change my moods, change my methods. Change me, O oh Lord. I need your help. If you feel led to come up here, just don't worry about anybody on the left or the right. Don't worry about me. Just start worshiping God in your own way, talking to Him in your own way. If you want to kneel, some people are already kneeling. If you want to stand, we're not going to hold hands. We're not going to lay hands on one another. This is between you and God. He is the potter. You are the clay. Let Him touch you. Let Him touch you. He's going to take some things out of your life. So some good things can flourish. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lamona Hukudi Basasta. Change my heart, O oh Lord. Make it more like you. Change my heart, O oh Lord. Make it ever true. Change my heart, dear God. Change my mind and my soul. Change me. I want to be whole. I want to follow you. I want to be pliable. I want to be yielded. I want to be putty. I want to be clay. I want you to be able to mold me and shape me. Praise God. New things. New things. New things. New things. It takes new wineskin for new wine. It takes new vessels to carry a new anointing. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. New things, new things, new things, new things, new things. Boy, for the past few months, I have invited God into my life every morning and every evening, and sometimes in between, and with all sincerity, I've asked God to sift me and try me and prove me and shake me and mold me. And I've had to visit some things that weren't too pleasant about me. But oh, it's so wonderful and so peaceful after He's changed you. Praise God. I don't think we're ever going to stop changing. I'm one of those people who believe, because I know the nature of God in eternity, that things are just going to keep expanding and keep growing. There's always going to be more to learn, more to receive, more to achieve, even in eternity. We're going to grow and grow and grow. We're going to know things we didn't know. We're going to see things only He can show. Change, change, change. 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 Be changed. Be rearranged. Be changed. Be changed. It starts with a willingness. To be willing to be changed. 
to be willing. When God touches you, it changes you. When God breathes on you, it changes you. When God steps into your life, it changes you. The closer you get to Him, the more profound the change is. It's irresistible. It's nuclear. It's atomic. Even more. It takes us apart. Puts us back together right. It adjusts every part. God has a blueprint for your life. Ha <laughs> ha. Yeah. Don't give up on yourself. God's not through. He's got more for you to do. It never stops. As we grow older, we still have so much more to learn. I'm embracing it. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Pastor John, why don't you uh, just be a pastor here for a few minutes and do what you need to do. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I was sharing with my wife, just reminding her of something that I we had said here. Um, actually, it was a couple of years ago. I was taking a, what Brother Larry was just saying. I was looking at my own life, my own spiritual life, physical life, everything about my life. And, uh, you know, just there's that human side of you that says, well, this needs to change. <laughs> Oh, I've tried to change there, and that hasn't changed. You know, and we, we see that about ourselves. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and he said, I've got your future in my hands. He said, you've, you've been faithful. You've not quit on me. You know, the fact that you're here tonight tells me you haven't quit on him. Now, you maybe have made a million mistakes like all the rest of us have, but you haven't quit on God. And let me tell you something, he's not going to quit on you. This last week, he's had me studying El Shaddai. Genesis chapter 17, Abraham and Sarah came to a place in their life. Abraham was 100, he was 99 years old, she was 90. God came to them and he said, you're going to have a, a child. It's going to be between you. And they weren't, they weren't all up in faith about that. We talked about it this last Sunday. They laughed the last laugh of cynicism. They were cynical about that promise, weren't they? Sarah even denied that she laughed. But God says, nope, it's going to happen, and it's not going to be a substitute through Hagar. It's going to happen between you two because, and this is the first time that this, this name is used for God, he says, I am El Shaddai. I heard a, a minister share how that he had, was preaching on El Shaddai in a a rabbi came to him after the service that was in this meeting, and he said, you know, you preached tonight that El Shaddai is the God of more than enough. But he said, he says, that's true, but it's not complete. He said, here's the closest definition that we've been able to come up out of the Hebrew with what El Shaddai means. El Shaddai means I am the God of total ruin and devastation, and I have come to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. In other words, God's saying anything or anybody that gets in my way, I am going to destroy it, defeat it, bring it down in order to bring to you what I promised you uh, because I am going to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. And so all he's asking you to do going into 2018 is receive him as El Shaddai, the God that's going to do it for you. He's just asking you to trust him, put your life in his hands, ask him for revelation, ask him to enlighten you, ask him to talk to you, ask him to lead you, and as you follow him, you're going to walk into, some of you are going to find yourself in places you never thought you'd find yourself, you're going to be able to do things you never thought you'd be able to do, you're going to walk in the fullness of some things that God has for you, and like he told me a couple of years ago, he said, if I tried to explain to you where we're going, 
you wouldn't even be able to understand it because it's exceeding beyond what you can ask or even think. Amen. So that's what we're opening up to tonight. We're saying, Lord, I put my life in your hands. You are El Shaddai. You are the El Shaddai God that blessed bless the lineage. And you said that we would multiply, that we would be fruitful, and that we would be able to possess the place that you've given us to possess. And so we thank you that 2018 is the beginning of the manifestation. Just like with Abraham and Sarah, there was a manifestation of a promise that was totally, absolutely impossible by natural law. But because you are El Shaddai and we receive you as we've received the prophet tonight, we receive you as El Shaddai God in our life. And we thank you that you have come to remove, to defeat, to destroy any demon or anything that gets in your way, and you are going to be the God that's more than enough, and you are going to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And we receive it tonight in Jesus' name. Glory to God. Hallelujah. When Samuel walked in and poured oil on David's head, I guarantee you David didn't know that in just a few days he'd be standing before a, a giant telling him his future. Amen? But that's where he stood, and that's what he did. And my friend, he that is greater in you is going to do the same thing through you. So we receive, Lord, what you have for us. Now open your heart to him. Spend some time with him. Listen to him. Ask him to reveal. Ask him to un unveil truth. Or if there's a change or there's a, like Brother Larry Huggins said, if there's a, something he wants you to start doing or stop doing or go here or not go there or whatever, I'm open to it, Lord, because you are El Shaddai and you're taking me in. We thank you for what you've shared with us tonight, Lord. We know it's been the word of the Lord. I know it's been the word of the Lord tremendous confirmation of what you've been talking to us here about in the church and lord i thank you for everyone that's here that this is just the the launching point the starting place for what you're going to manifest in their lives this year <laughs> some of you've got joseph promises man you've been standing for a long time and you're going to find yourself leaving the outhouse and going to the penthouse some of you have been believing for god to restore and the devil's just been beating you up telling you it's not going to happen how long have you believed this and all of that nonsense but i'm telling you that suddenly is coming you're going to break out into the breakthrough of god and you're going to stand in what god has for you he is not a liar praise god we thank you father in jesus name amen amen well god bless you Tomorrow morning at 9.30, we're going to have service again. Tomorrow night at 6 o'clock again, Brother Larry will be ministering. Uh, if you can't make it, if you're attending your church or something like that, it will be uh, streamed live on our Facebook page or on, uh, on Facebook, Believer's Church Facebook. So if you want to watch or you know someone that, that maybe can't make it and they'd like to watch the service and hear what's being ministered, just share it with them. God bless you. Have a great night's sleep and the peace and the joy and the blessing of God. Amen.